Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Susan Waxman, and I'm going to be hosting this panel. And um, because we don't have a whole lot of time, and I chose some pretty big questions here, I would like to get right started. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody who submitted a question. And um, oh, goodness, I'm sorry. Um, and the whole thing is, we can't pick all the questions. So I chose some questions that I thought would be the most interesting and relevant to the time. Additionally, I added my own question, which is the first question I'm going to ask. And um, I'm going to have, it's under philosophy. I divided it into three different sections, philosophy, lifestyle, and cooking. Um, so we're going to go into philosophy first. And the first person I'd like to speak is Carl. So. Um, the question is, what is the significance of self-reliance and macrobiotics or within macrobiotic practice? Okay, thank you. Um, privileged to be here. Thank you, Gannat, for organizing this. Finally made it. Um, so uh, I'm going to start by giving a story uh, about Herman Ihara. I was driving them around the country on one of their tours where they go around the country teaching macrobiotics in 1979. And we got to Santa Fe and he gave this wonderful lecture on self-reliance. And he said, you don't need anything but yourself. You don't need any books, you don't need anything else. So it was a wonderful lecture. And at the end of it, we sold no books. I was selling books, you know, and that was my job was to drive and sell books. We sold no books. So I never heard the lecture again. A year later, I said, Herman, you gave this wonderful lecture. Why didn't you ever give it again? Was it because we didn't sell any books? And he said, no, because I realized that books are part of life too. So are doctors, so is Coca-Cola, so is meat, so is vegetables, so everything is part of life. We learn from everything. And so the self-reliance thing, I think it's overblown. It's more, to me, it's more about self-responsibility. Macrobiotics gives us these wonderful tools that we can use to better ourselves. And we use them that way. Um, and we learn that every front has a back. And the bigger the front, the bigger the back. So macrobiotics has a big front, in my view. It also has a big back. And that big back, the main big back I see is arrogance because we begin to think that we know the answers and other people don't. So yes, rely on yourself, but realize that when you make a decision, you're making a decision you're relying on yourself, but you're deciding to let someone else help you. That's why counselors are important. That's why books are important. That's why we, you know, rely on other people. So um, that would be my response. It's everything you do is really your own self-reliance, but you're allowing other people to help you. So thank you. Um that was a great answer. Thank you, Carl. Um, I'd like to hear from Denny now. Well, I, I love the story. I could see uh, Herman uh, saying it. So I, I, I agree with both self-reliance and self-responsibility because most people now, even within the macrobiotic community, are looking outside themselves. And uh, it seems to me people are giving up their personal power, their personal ability, um, rather than, well, self-reliance doesn't mean not using doctors, counselors, books, everything in the universe. It just, to me, it means we choose. We use our own judgment and we make choices that are appropriate for ourselves and our situation that might include others and our family. And when I hear self-reliance, I always think of something. Um, one of my heroes was Miyamoto Musashi, the famous Japanese swordsman who developed the two-sword technique. And he wasn't actually the greatest Japanese swordsman. He was the greatest strategist. He was actually number two. And he decided to never become number one. 
And one of his sayings was when he was in this impossible situation, I believe in God and the Buddha, but I rely on myself. And that's basically, no one thought he'd survive this battle, but he did. So I'll just leave you with that thought. Thank you. And I, I'm happy to be part of this as well. Oh, thank you, Denny. Um, and Sherry, um, would you like to add too? Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> um, yeah, why not? <laughs> okay. I agree. You know, I thought Carl's story was really uh, helpful and Denny's comments as well. And I agree to use, you know, the resources that you have. And it's important really when you start cooking and taking care of yourself that you reach out and try to form a community where you live um, to support you. Sometimes people don't have family members there to help them out. And even if you're on Zoom to, you know, hook up with some of the conferences and stuff and um, ask a lot of questions. Um, it's, it's difficult sometimes because we're bombarded. Denny said a very interesting thing to me a while ago. You know, I was asking him why some people who are longtime macrobiotic people got sick, you know, severely sick and went off the diet. He said, sometimes the society or the outside world just swallows you up and you, you know, were bombarded with media now so much on the computers and phones. And it's really important to listen to more of our inner guidance and what makes sense to us. Um, so yeah, I think the combination of both, but also remember to get a nice community formed around you for support. Thank you, Sherry. Um, so I don't know if I'm muted or not muted, I guess not. Um, uh, those are all fantastic answers and I agree with everything. I think, um, you know, like when you first start practicing macrobiotics, you do hear a lot about self-reliance. And um, I think that's wonderful. And I think, you know, like um, studying is really part of your self-reliance, reading as much as you can and, and finding things out for yourself not just like going on what somebody says, but really like doing the research and doing the homework for yourself and then like practicing for yourself. And then I also feel that um, if you do get into trouble, it is very, very important that you reach out to somebody else, somebody that you feel like has a balanced condition and a balanced perspective because um, we're human beings and we're not really meant to like walk this walk all by ourselves. Uh, I think that's very, very important. And I think that plays into what Carl was talking about, arrogance, because too many people just think like, oh, you know, like I'll handle this myself. And then they end up getting into deeper trouble. So I'll just like leave you with that thought. Uh, so uh, we answered that one qu pretty quickly. I'm going to move on to section uh, the second question under philosophy that I chose, and that is, is there such a thing as a perfect macrobiotic practice? Um, and the second part to that was, is if somebody does get sick or even like passes, um, does that mean failure? So uh, I'll put it back to you, Carl. Oh, golly, I get to go first. <laughs> Wait, do you want Danny to go first or <laughs> that's okay? Yeah, let's let Danny, Danny go first on this one. Okay, Danny, you're up. Okay, is there a perfect macrobiotic practice? No, and even if there would be such a thing, it wouldn't be a worthy goal because life is about perfection and change. And there, there's a saying in the West Indies that I absolutely love, too much of one thing is good for nothing. And it's one of my guiding principles, never... It's not good to even be too good or to be too perfect because if we, as we know in macrobiotics, when we hit the one extreme, we're thrown over to the other, right? Whether, whether we like it or not. Um, as far as is death a failure in macrobiotic practice, I don't think so at all. Um, Nietzsche once said, it's worthwhile if someone starts to practice macrobiotics even three days before they're passing because they get energy for their journey. They have an easier passing. I've seen it myself many times. And even, you know, long time macrobiotic people, I mean, it's, it's a journey. And there are many chapters to this journey. And if we're not successful this one, 
it's it's how we live our life and how we pass to me, you know, is really the, the most important thing. And, you know, it's come apparent many people practicing macrobiotics uh, may not die healthy in the way they wanted to, but it's part of the journey. My thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carl, would you like to go next or? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that was um, the perfect answer <laughs> <laughs> to the perfect question. Anyway, um, I would shoot for 70 to 80% if you can do that. If you can get that high, you're doing great with your macrobiotic practice. <clears throat> I don't think illness is a failure. I think illness is an opportunity to challenge yourself and to look at what you're doing. When I started macrobiotics, I was very, very strict for many years. I, I drank no liquid for 25 years. Um, you know, because the, the book said drink as little as possible, and I read that literally, and I was a math major, so that's zero, and so I didn't drink anything. I had miso soup every day. That's the only liquid I have. So now I have an inner ear problem, which is related to the kidneys, right? So there you go. So I, I know that, and now I can deal with that, but I, it was a challenge, something I could do. So there's no perfect answer. And I wrote a, an article in 2002 called Fatal Flaws in Macrobiotics, which was talking about how people were saying, oh, if you pressure cook brown rice, you're gonna die from it. And people were saying all these kinds of things that things that were wrong with macrobiotics. And um, I just kind of debunked each one as we went along, um, saying that those aren't, aren't part of it. So no, um, death is a transition, not a, not a failure ever. That's my answer. And Sherry? Um, I, <laughs> I totally agree with Denny about um, death and how important it is even at the last stages of life to eat really well um, because you're actually the womb for the next world, eating your womb for the next world. And when I was cooking for my mother, um, you know, she had never taken any medicine. And when she finally went to the hospital last time before she passed, I was, um, the doctors were shocked that she was so aware and she was actually talking while she was dying, explaining that she was losing feeling in her feet and the energy was moving up through her body. And the minister was there and he said, I never saw anything like this ever. You know, he's always been in hospitals watching or helping people pass. And I thought to myself, you know, it was because we were, I was cooking for, her, you know, the last four years of her life. And she wasn't the medication, um, you know, because of her good eating was not affecting her so much with her cl um, mental clarity and, and um, you know, her inflammation and things like that. And it was very peaceful. And so I think, you know, even if the person has no strength at all, just to make some rice cream or rice milk and help them along the way is really important. Yeah, thank you again, uh, all wonderful answers. And thank you for your story and sharing that, Sherry. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I've also cooked for people, um, well, like right before they passed, I was probably like the last meal that they had was something that I cooked. Um, I think probably the hardest thing is explaining that when somebody calls oftentimes for a consultation and they're really calling, you know, like as that last ditch effort to try and, and do something. And, um, you know, then Denny having explaining that. And then like, I've had people that actually asked and requested that I cook for somebody who's in the hospital. And she said, what do you think? And I said, well, and you know, like I explained the exact same thing that Sherry was saying and Carl and Denny that, you know, um, even if your husband or wife doesn't make it, it um, the food that they're eating is going to help them along their journey and help them with their easing and moving into the next world. So uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting and that's a tough conversation to have with somebody, but you have it. And um, I'm grateful that I can just like, you know, like be honest 
with people. So, okay, um, something a little less heavy <laughs> now. Um, let's move on to the cooking part of this. So um, I'm gonna hear from Sherry first. Um, and the first question I chose was, do we consider nutrition or food energetics? Um, and then I added to that when preparing and planning foods that you're going to make or planning meals? So um, I primarily look at food energetics. And if you consider the five transformations, you know, really study them well. Um, looking at five tastes, you want your, you want your regular meals to feel balanced and colorful and nutritious. Um, but I think in more macrobiotic thinking, we think more in terms of the energy of the food as opposed to nutrition, because if you read Colin Campbell's book, Whole Foods, you know, food has so much nutrition in it and in its whole form, it has a thousand billion ways of interacting in your body. And you can't really separate, you know, this has vitamin C or that has vitamin E or whatever, and go by that because there's so many more dynamics or energy going on in your foods. So considering the five transformations, um, looking at the five tastes, you know, sour, salty, pungent, um, and, um, sweet, and then cooking styles. You know, you want some food to be crunchy, you want some food to be soft and um, creamy, and then colors, it's really important, and including as much variety as you can. I mean, I think that, Basically, if you take any sick person and you start them on macrobiotic food, um, you know, and some people don't even know about remedies yet, their condition naturally improves over time because you're taking away all the junk and then you're including good nutritious food, whole foods um, and variety, uh, which is really important as well as, you know, eating regular meals and chewing well and, um, having meals on time. But I think energetics, uh, we consider a little bit more important than nutrition. Nutrition's always there. I mean, we try to study it as much as possible and give recommendations, you know, if, if we know something's really helpful for a particular condition, um, but energetics is really important. Thank you. Mary, was this the book that you just mentioned, whole, Dealing with Whole Foods? Or what book did no, you just refer Colin to? Colin Campbell's book is called Just Whole Foods. It's mm. Colin Campbell. Mm. Uh -huh. The new okay. book. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then okay, I'm Colin thinking, Campbell, Healing with uh, Whole Foods. I'm sorry. It might just be called Whole, but I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. Whole. Okay. It was in my office. I could pull a copy off the shelf, but I'm not in my office. <laughs> All right. um, I'm going to hear from Carl next to respond to that question. And then um, I'm going to hear from Denny last. And then I have like a part B to that question that I, I would like to hear, have Denny answer like both those questions. So um, Carl. Okay. Well, I'll I'll start with another personal story. When I started acrobatics, I decided to have a chart and to write down every food that I was eating and every vitamin and every mineral, amount of protein, amount of carbohydrate, everything on a chart. I had this long chart, not Excel in those days. It would have been great to have Excel, but anyway, I uh, had this long chart and I had all the foods in there and I found that I had plenty of nutrition on a macrobiotic diet. So you don't really have to worry about nutrition. So I agree with Sherry. I would also say one other comment, which Herman made, because I, I saw a comment about food being physical. Um, and Herman said when he taught to the Zen Center, he made a big mistake and because they didn't want to follow macrobiotics because they said it was physical, it wasn't spiritual. And Herman made the point that food is spirit. Spirit is food. So always remember, food and spirit are not ever separated. Pass it to Denny. Okay, thank you. So Denny, I have the same question, but I want to add 
when you're making recommendations, what do you consider? Okay, that's, that's a big question. So basically, when we eat, we break solid food, physical food down to liquid and then to energy. So most of our food goes to energy, which means an energetic approach it is much more direct. It's much more efficient because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to nourish people physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually on, on all different levels. So that gives us a, a much broader range. Um, so, you know, when, when someone comes to see me for counseling, I try to see them as a healthy person. What do they need? In other words, here's where they are. What do they need to go there? Now, if someone is, you know, has severe osteoporosis, I do think, okay, what are good sources of calcium? I'm like, okay, beans and greens and sesame seeds, et cetera. But so it's not, no, don't consider nutrition. It's but the overall thrust, the great, great majority is how to nourish them energetically. So I think that, that's the power of macrobiotics. You have that ability. Okay, thank you, Danny. Thank you, Carl and Sherry. Um, yeah, again, I would add that um, generally speaking, I consider food as energy and you know, like that's my approach when I'm cooking, when I'm planning things out. Um, when I'm making recommendations, then I also want to say that sometimes we need to adapt and we may think that, okay, the energy of this might, you know, like be, you know, like um, different, like, for example, like what if somebody has like a particular condition where, you know, like plant-based food isn't completely working for them and you may have to, um, use some animal food, you know, like, are you willing to do that? Well, you know, like sometimes that's maybe like what you need to do. Um, Cause either way, I still think that food is a better choice to get that nutrient and to get, even the energy of animal food is not smooth like plant food, but you're still getting the nutritional aspect that that individual needs. And it's still better than I would think that artificially getting that through some type of medication. So, um, you know, like that's my thought there. If anybody wants to add to anything like that, you know, you certainly, you certainly can, you know, um, mm -hmm. I've personally been in that situation and, you know, like you, you do what you have to do to, again, make this person well and bring this individual's condition back to balance. So does anybody have anything to add? Balance is really important. I think sometimes, especially with old style macrobiotics, which Denny and Susan have been really working hard at demystifying and trying to bring it up more modernly, that we look at, you know, some of the habits of old style macrobiotics is, you know, more brown rice or more umeboshi or more miso and people get stuck in their conditions, you know, very salty contracted conditions. And um, more is not always better, you know, more balance is better or more, like Denny said, being in touch with the person and seeing what they're really uh, needing at the time um, and keeping an open mind, like Susan said, you know, using all sorts of variety of food when necessary. Um, so it's, it's really important, I think, at this stage in the game because our, society and world are becoming more and more contracted very quickly and that we look to broaden the diet and keep it you know within a good range but broaden it and keep it balanced and and uh really helping balance the condition of people and look at where they're coming from because i think too many times people get stuck it's like uh, sort of like stuck in a cycle of, well, you know, Misha said to put half grain on your plate or, um, you know, to eat brown rice or barley miso every day. I mean, and lots of people, as I travel, even in Europe and stuff, I see that they're sort of stuck in that spot and their conditions are not improving, but they're not aware of that they're not improving. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with you. <laughs> um, does anybody else want to add any more to this um, discussion? 
Let's go on. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, we'll move on to lifestyle. Um, so this question I'm going to ask uh, Benny first, and then about organic versus non-organic. Um, oh, I thought I had put that in lifestyle. Okay. Oh, yeah. Le yeah. Let's do that first, and then we'll move on to lifestyle questions. I may have like shifted that question into lifestyle because I had to send two versions of this PDF and pages. Uh, okay. and Max, I work in pages. So um, yeah. So the question would be. Um, how important are organic foods and organic locally grown foods or, or, or organic versus locally grown? Um, so then I'll ask uh, Sherry first. Um, just be aware that the use of glyphosate have like quadrupled in our country right now. United States is really strange. They, we don't ban much of anything like the... Um, bovine hormones and milk, you know, that directly cause, you know, can contribute to prostate cancer and the amount of glyphosate that are being sprayed on our lawns. And, and, you know, we're finding, I have a gardener come over all the time. He tells me this story about how his neighbors both spray their lawns and there's no lightning bugs or mosquitoes or anything left. There's no bees. And, um, that glyphosate is so harmful to our bodies in, in terms of you know, destroying our microbiome and reducing our, um, our immune system. So it's super important now. I think a lot of uh, organic, supposedly organic foods, they say come from China and that's sometimes questionable. So shopping local, and as much as you can find out about your local sources in terms of whether they grow organics or sometimes they can't afford to be certified, but at least you know they haven't sprayed their soil for a long time. The importance of good, healthy soil is so important for our health. So. Mm, all true. Mm -hmm. um, Carl, do you have something to add? Uh, sure, if, if I'm having to choose, uh, first off, I now have a garden, so I now choose the organic <laughs> local food. But uh, if I have to choose, I would choose organic foods first, local food second, and anything else that I need third. I mean, uh, that's the order I would put them in. Uh, I think organic is the most important. And then you can go to local. We have farmer's markets here all over the place and we have neighbors We've got five, at least five families on our block that grow organic food and put out the extra on tables in front for everybody else to try. So um, that's what we do and it works great. Thank you. Denny? Um, I agree with everyone. I think organic is more important than ever before because food quality is just going and soil quality going down dramatically. So I just like to add to that also in macrobiotics, we use indigenous foods that have originated in the same or similar climatic zone. So basically by, by latitude around the world. And I think it's another uniqueness of, of macrobiotics. So always considering that not as a hard fast rule, but as a general tendency and preference. And, you know, I, I agree with Carl. We, we choose foods from our local farmer's market that are not completely organic because they look like they're still growing with care. And <laughs> they're local, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with everything that, that everybody says. Um, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I try to grow a number of things in our back uh, yard in, in Philadelphia, I have grow bags <laughs> and I like build my own, like some raised garden beds. And yeah, I try to I have to like import soil, but I usually try to get like, you know, like good organic soil, um, from local sources. And there are quite a good bit of local sources are around here that you can do that. Um, and yes, I am plagued with all kinds of different pests, but it is very easy to <laughs> make your own simple, safer soap because sometimes like certain things, of course the bugs they have to eat too. Right now I'm in a battle with the spotted lantern flies. Um, mm -hmm. 
that my one friend described as like aliens, they keep coming back. Well, I shouldn't say aliens, zombies. <laughs> I said like zombies, they keep coming back. But um, it's very easy to do that. And um, again, as Denny said, like a lot of places, uh, food in farmer's markets, you like when you go there, start a conversation with the people um, because oftentimes their things are grown chemical free. And, um, you know, like they'll say that uh, they don't necessarily have their organic certification because, you know, like it comes down to like money too. So um, it's always fun to talk and it's always fun to look around and like, you know, look at like what speaks to you. So, um, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that question. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing. You know, the interesting thing is when I'm teaching cooking that um, a lot of my clients tell me, oh, I, I'm trying to grow kale or whatever in my backyard and not using organic seeds, organic soil, and they're swamped with bugs. I don't even have bugs. It's so weird on my kale or collards or <laughs> whatever. And I'm thinking like, you know, if you get really strong soil, really good soil and really good um, organic seeds, I think they're actually stronger in yeah. a way. Um, so you don't have a big variety of bugs. Yeah, I just, I have like my, my few like little ones too. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's there, you know, like the common ones like aphids are like kind of like pretty easy to take care of. Um, mm -hmm. So, so and, and you don't want the bees, you really want bees and you want ladybugs. So you know, like you have to like really, really be aware. Um so okay. Uh let's move on to oh, I am so sorry. My cat is being relentless. Um he's a mama baby. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so um let's move on to lifestyle here. Um, so I want to ask this, this was an interesting question that someone posed and it was about fasting and they asked, is intermittent fasting beneficial? And if so, how do you recommend doing this? Um, I want to pose that question to Denny first. Uh, so if you would, please. You. So macrobiotics, if we follow the guidelines for healthy eating ends by 8 p.m., and we don't eat for three hours before bed, then we have breakfast around 8 a.m., we automatically have 12 hours of intermittent fasting every night. Then if two, three times a week you skip breakfast, then you get up to 16 hours. And I think that's a good combination because macrobiotics, in essence, is, is a lifelong fast. For the most part, we're fasting from animal foods, dairy foods, and you know, simple sugars, things like that. You know, for, for the most part. So if we keep the 12 hours every night and then a few times a week, 16 hours, I think that's like an ideal combination of, you know, of intermittent fasting that allows us to still be really satisfied. Ask one more question there. Can you just like elaborate also um, like the benefits of intermittent fasting and also for people that are taking certain medical treatments how intermittent fasting or even like fasting for a couple of days is, is really helpful to make that treatment more effective. Yeah, I mean, simply it reboots the immune system and strengthens our ability to eliminate. You know, one thing I said before, I think sickness among macrobiotic people is that what goes in is important. So we've emphasized that what you eat is so important, but our ability to eliminate or detoxify or release what we don't need, I don't think there's enough emphasis on that. And intermittent fasting then allows us to release, to detoxify what we don't need much more effectively. So I think it's the, you know, the perfect balance, or ideal balance between taking in and giving out. So that, that's really what we're looking for, not too much one side or the other. Okay, thank you. Um, Carl? Well, okay. uh, uh, I would say fasting depends on the individual and the purpose. So for, for me, I mean, I asked Thurman once if, if I should do, do a number seven diet, and he said, heavens no, you're skinny enough already. <laughs> why, why do you want to fast? So it depends on the person and the, and the purpose of what you're doing it for. And I also, 
if someone does want to do kind of a half fast, there's always the number seven diet. You always do grains or what um, I believe it's Chua Hashimoto does in Japan, a half fast with brown rice cereal uh, that you have and do it that way. But basically you're trying to clean out. To, as I say, a fast is a clean out. And <clears throat> if you don't have anything to clean out, you have no reason to fast other than intermittent fasting, which we all do overnight. Okay, thank you. Sherry? Um, just be careful. I have a lot of girlfriends that do this. Be careful of blood sugar because uh, Denny used to say lunch is the most important meal of the day. Um, you want to make sure that um, you're not doing it so much that your blood sugar level falls and then you know, you'll just wind up with all these cravings and overeating and things like that. So I think if you do it, choose to do it in a gentle way, maybe with juices and soups. And Misho used to always say it's so important when you come off a of fast, you know, come off gently, um, you know, and just not over, over push your body. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one thing to add, and that is, um, so uh, for days, or if you want to go for a few days without having that morning meal, um, you can start it simply, you know, like with some tea or a vegetable juice. Uh, that's helpful. That's especially helpful in the springtime, like a spring cleaning. So you're not completely, as Sherry was saying, not having anything, but you're having something that, you know, is actively stimulating something. So oftentimes, like if we recommend certain home remedies, they're done in the morning, especially if it, the intention is to detox. And because you're consuming all the ingredients, you know, like that's kind of a lot and that can like fill you up. So you really don't need anything more. And that actually stimulates um, the body and enables it to eliminate some of the things that, you know, like we just simply, you know, like don't really need or are not serving us very well. Um, together with that, if you do choose the intermittent fasting, intermittent, excuse me, fasting, where, you know, you're going to skip breakfast, um, a day here and there during the week, or um, oftentimes like in the summertime uh, when it's really hot, you know, like I don't get hungry in the morning, then what you can always do, so your blood sugar doesn't dip, because you remember you've had all that time at night, you can bump up your morning, I mean, your lunchtime. You know, it's perfectly fine to have lunch at, you know, 1130. And, you know, personally, that suits me really well, especially when the weather is warm. I did that today. I feel good. I crave nothing and I'm happy. So um, thank you. <laughs> Okie doke. Um, we're going to move on. Um, next question. Would you recommend using supplements? And if so, which one? So who would like to answer that first? Which one of you? Raise your hand. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Okay. So, okay, so first, uh, when you say recommend, I, I have to say I'm not a counselor and I, I only did one consultation the guy survived, so I, <laughs> I quit doing them. So, uh, <laughs> But basically, uh, that said, now I forgot where I was going. Um, what are we on supplements? Okay, so I would, I would say that if you could do it without supplements, that's probably the best. But again, it goes back to perfect practice. If you need supplements, by all means, take them. That's my, my opinion. Um, I take plenty of them now. I didn't used to, but I do now. Uh, I prefer supplements over medications. So if you get in a situation where you have a, a disease of some kind, an illness of some kind, and you could heal it with supplements for a temporary use till you get over that, yes, why not? That's my opinion. So as far as which ones, um, you know, in, in macrobiotics, you can go from B12 to D to C to, you know, uh, what, ginkgo ginseng, uh, <laughs> you know, calcium if you need it, um, vitamin D, D if I didn't say that. Um, so yeah, there and zinc, I mean, 
uh, lately there's all this about COVID and there's a lot of uh, advice on different supplements to take to help with your immune system for COVID. So um, those are in articles in Macrobetics Today, by the way, um, in an article in the last issue and in the next issue. So in coming up in summer. So I'll pass it on to someone else. Okay, who wants to go next? <laughs> okay, Denny. <laughs> Okay, for a long time, I was very hardline against supplements. I'm not anymore. Um, only because throughout the years, more people have had issues with B12. It's not harmful. So there's no harm if you take too much, your body excretes it. Um, a few of the MDs that I respect are against vitamin D supplementation. However, I, you know, Lao Tzu said, I never hesitate. Um, to be timid. You know, some, so I, I think it's always better to be safe than, than sorry. And during the winter, I don't think it can hurt to take vitamin D. I mean, the safest is do a blood test to see. And if you are low during the winter to do vitamin D or codfish, liver oil, fermented uh, version, you may, I think it's acceptable the rest of the year, of course, to get out and play in the sun. And, you know, I don't know if you feel your immunity is weak, as Carl said, you know, zinc and vitamin C, but macrobiotics is so abundant in vitamin C. So if you're having lightly cooked vegetables and sauerkraut and some oranges, all those things, you should get plenty of vitamin C. Zinc, you know, is available through the diet. And the other nutrient I think that is very important in macrobiotics is iodine, which comes from seaweed, especially kelp, some and nori, to make sure that you're keeping seaweed as part of your diet because iodine is very important for immunity as well. So it's, you know, like Carl said, it's, it's a more soft approach. It depends on our needs and how we feel about it. Could I yeah, I agree with Denny that, um, I mean, we're using nutrients in our vegetables and in the soil too, and also in the atmosphere. So it's good to keep a check on them. Um, I don't think overdoing it though is helpful because it definitely hurts the liver and it, um, you know, you pee out a lot of it anyway. So you lose a lot of money <laughs> buying a lot of supplements. And if you're having a good macrobiotic practice, you really don't need a lot. Um, but it's good to keep your radar open and to you know, get blood tests and, and see um, if you're missing anything, especially in the winter with vitamin D. So I would just like to add, we're talking about vitamin D3 and not vitamin D2. There's a difference. So vitamin D3 is the one. The other thing I would mention with iodine, my friend, um, Large Hansen reminded me that if you toast nori, you take the iodine out of it, you lose the iodine in it. So if you're buying toasted nori, which we have a lot of because we got it donated for camp, but anyway, uh, we have a lot of toasted nori, uh, but there's it's not an iodine source, whereas normally it would be if it's hadn't been toasted. So I just throw that in there. Okay, so thank you um, very much. Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, so um, when we were talking about different things and um, Denny and I had a conversation about iodine, he said, I think that, you know, like for a long period of time, people were recommending, you know, like, like way back in the day, I remember the first macrobiotic cookbook I had was like Zen cookery with like huge pieces of kombu that looked more like, you know, like a sheet of nori rather than a piece of kombu. Um, and I followed it. <laughs> uh, uh, and then people make their condition too tight and too young. Um, so you shift and then there was this whole big shift of like, oh, you know, like only like these tiny pieces or oh this and, and oh that, and to move everything like the other way. And I do see things like kind of like in, in a lot of practice, like having like the same old kind of like conceptual habits um, 
of like young, as in like twice as many grains as vegetables, um, but then like going overboard with some other like things to try and make themselves more light. Um, and then forgetting some of the classic, what I call classic macrobiotic dishes that are really deeply nourishing and strengthening. And those things are um, really what creates our resolve, creates our strength, creates our strength on like so many different levels. So, you know, you don't want to um, throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. I think it's like very important to have a balance of both, like plenty of light, refreshing things and maybe like less quantity of grains. We recommend like a lot more vegetables and like beans too. Beans are like so important. So it's, it's, it's all part of really, as we were talking before, a, a balance and striking a balance. Um, and then together with that, having things like move through us, like good circulation. So uh, that, that's just so important. Uh, I don't want to take up much more time. Do we still have time for a few more questions, Ginot? Or um, are there questions that the audience has for anyone? So I'll tell you, um, I invite anybody who wants to leave to do so. We won't be insulted. And uh, officially, our time is up as long as our panelists are willing to stick around a little more. Um, sky's the limit. Or when I fall asleep. So. <laughs> let's keep going and uh again you know if you want to leave thank you for coming and we'll see you next month let's keep going okay um so what then i um i separated some other questions here that were asked uh let's talk about oil for a moment um so what's the preferred um type of oil that uh we like uh, to use and if so what are the best ways to incorporate the use of oil? Uh, so who would like to go first? Maybe let's hear for the ladies. Sherry, you go first. Ladies before gentlemen. Well, um, I simply just use the mild olive oil, um, sesame oil, toasted sesame oil, um, and try not to keep it too hot a temperature. Like Susan and Denny always recommend putting, you know, if you heat it up, add oil, uh, water right away, keep it, you know, not too high heat. Um, I think we're moving a little bit away from like doing everything deep fried. I know they still do it a lot in Amsterdam, um, but you know, that fire, that hot oil fire energy, I think right now with everything going on in the world, it's a little bit not as balancing. Um, yeah. so basically i think you can cut out oil for a little bit if you have a, a concerned health condition you know especially heart issues and then um add it a little bit in to widen out your diet when you want to um but i think using oil is important generally okay um who wants to go next well, I guess I guess I can. I, I went on the cruise. I was very interested to hear Dr. Esselstyn and his no oil. He kept shouting no oil <laughs> through the whole thing. So, uh, and I guess for, uh, as Sherry mentioned, for heart condition patients and stuff, maybe that's a good idea. I don't know. Um, we the thing I would say about oil is to caution overheating it. And that's why we don't deep fry so much anymore because oil denatures at 240 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you heat it over that, you're denaturing the oil and you might get free radicals and all kinds of other stuff that you don't want. So keep, keep the heat low on the oil. Uh, baking is a problem as I see it. We, we use coconut oil in baking because it doesn't denature. It's a saturated fat though, so you've got to balance that. You got to remember you're eating a saturated fat if you use it, so you got to balance that. Um, otherwise, we use the standard uh, sesame, <coughs> sesame and olive um, uh, are the two main ones that we use. And uh, I 
usually don't use any oil in my cooking because uh, Julia does, <laughs> but I, I don't because I'm very simple. I cook and eat very simply. Uh, so, and it seems to work. So that's a, oh, uh, if you want to read a good person who has good version on um, the heating of oils, Rebecca Wood's book, uh, The New Whole Foods Encyclopedia is a great book. She mel me melds together macrobiotics and Ayurvedic and has, it's a great resource for all foods. You can read about what they do energetically and what they, uh, their benefits and their harm and what kinds to, best kinds to buy and everything else. So uh, that's a good resource. And she has a great section on oils. So that's my comment. Thank you. Um, Denny? Um, so, I mean, oil is a big question. Oil's under attack by some of our prominent vegan MDs. No salt, no oil, no sugar. Macrobiotics, we agree about no sugar. The question is, okay, Oil has a long history in all the civilizations that have great health and great longevity, especially sesame and olive oil, which can be pressed you know, with, without heat or solvents. Second thing is, what's the purpose of oil? Well, number one, it tastes good. It's more satisfying. <laughs> number two, it raises the, if we're talking about an energetic approach, it raises the energy of the food. Food cooked with oil has, has higher energy. Then it aids in the absorption, which I think is very important, of minerals and fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And it helps carry them deep into the body and nervous system. So I, I think oil, you know, to be used in the way that we use it, not too much, not overheating it, is very good. Recently, I um, had a conversation with a uh, a researcher and basically was mostly macrobiotic about, you know, deep frying, which used to be prominent in macrobiotic cooking. And his response was, I think it's okay occasionally if it's part of a healthy overall diet. And I think that's really the key with everything. If our overall diet and lifestyle are good and healthy, then it's much more forgiving what we do. So I wouldn't say never deep fry, although I can't remember the last time we deep fried. It's, it's a matter of choice. So the only thing I have to add about oil, because everybody pretty much said a lot of stuff, um, you want to really be careful about the oil and the restaurants you choose while eating out. Um, choose a better restaurant uh, where you're going to get like real olive oil. Uh, most restaurants aren't going to do sesame oil unless it's like a really good high-end Japanese type of restaurant. Um, I would completely avoid deep fried foods while you're out because most of that stuff is fried in a fry -a layer, a fry -a later or something where it's just like this vat in stainless steel that's like filled with oil and there's a basket and it gets dunked in there. So that oil usually is not ever completely turned off, meaning that it stays at a particular temperature and then they'll like raise it. But if it's a high turnover, that oil is like hot all the time. And as soon as you put that basket in there, it's like, so um, if you're still consuming French fries, even the sweet potato fries, polenta sticks, I just like would not do that. Um, all that oil is going to be genetically modified, um, crap oil. And you can even sometimes like smell it outside of the place. Uh, I would tend to like definitely avoid that. It's not as bad as like the night market that I've experienced in Taiwan, <laughs> which was like completely disgusting. And the oil was black and we had to like wrap our clothes in plastic. Um, but uh, yeah, it's like it. It's approaching there. Um, so yeah, don't, don't do that. It's just a recipe like literally for disaster. And that fast, it can really spoil all the good things that you're doing. If you do get caught in a situation where you get something deep fried, you can always go home, grade some daikon, put a couple drops and show you on it and like eat the raw grated daikon. That is probably the fastest way to cut through bad oil. 
Uh, as far as baking, um, I actually have frozen olive oil to make pie crust uh, where it gets kind of like, and then you like use it where it's still slightly frozen and it works more similar to that of like butter consistency. Um, and I've done like walnut oil too. So, you know, you can give that a whirl to uh, different, different options there. Um, and that's all I have on oil. Uh, next question. What are your thoughts on commercially processed foods? Um, so in macrobiotics, we have our traditional food processing, which is fantastic and a great source of like nutrients and probiotics and number of wonderful things that we have. But then we have some products that, you know, like are commercially processed, um, such as like tofu, uh, tempeh, or even different types of like pickles and sauerkrauts. Um, even like I've seen like natto in different places and like stored in like, you know, little like styrofoam containers. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'll ask you first, Denny. Well, naturally processed foods in macrobiotics and in, in traditional uh, preparation throughout the world, the processing brings out some unique quality of the food. It's not like commercially uh, processed food, which destroy everything valuable about it. In macrobiotics, when we pickle, we're creating nutrients that weren't there before. When we make tofu, we're bringing out a unique part of, of the soybean that allows us to be nourished and absorb you know, other nutrients in different ways. So I think macrobiotics has really you know, captured the essence of food processing, not only from Asia, but you know, th throughout the world, something to be valued and prized and appreciated, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, Sherry? I, we were just having a conversation, Penny and Susan and I were at dinner about like the new uh, vegan burgers and how um, just horrendous the, the qualities are. Um, you know, not only <clears throat> like horrible, um, you know, processed ingredients, but also weird, bizarre GMO things. Um, you know, in chemicals. So we have to be really careful because um, I work for the cruise and I get a lot of these companies and we look at the ingredient list and they're a mile long. And, um, you know, I, I always question like, are the, they even a healthier substitute than the real thing? Um, you know, like the vegan cheeses and the yeah. processed, um, vegan meats and things like that. And it's getting more extreme because the companies are looking at it as a big money maker. So you have to be really careful. And I agree with Denny to stick with, you know, naturally fermented foods that we use in macrobiotics and learn to do them yourself too. Making tempeh and natto, especially making natto is very simple um, process. So the cleaner you can get them, the better off you are. And, um, you know, even with the soy milks, um, be careful, you know, all the, all the milks, the different milks and the um, soy butters and the creamers and things like that. Read the ingredient list and see what's in it. Um, but we, I wouldn't recommend much of any of those things. Carl? I would say we avoid them and only if there's nothing else available and I'm really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to avoid them. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> okay. Um, moving right along. Um, so this is a, like a really quick one. Um, what are your thoughts on the use of electricity, uh, propane? And I, I added to that other devices for cooking. Carl, you wanna answer that one first? Uh, well, yeah, I would say that first we have a solar oven and that's our favorite thing to cook with. Uh, we also lived in a house for many years that had electric, electric stove and we couldn't change it out. So we learned to cook on electricity. I think 
gas is better. So we did switch it out when we got the opportunity to do that. Now we have a gas stove. So we would do that. I always noticed at the French Meadows camps that we were cooking over wood fire. So that was optimum. We also took, I don't know, we had like five to seven solar ovens up there one year in the parking lot making cookies and all kinds of stuff, which is delicious. Uh, so, you know, as well as the wood fires, but that, you know, the, the better the source, to me, the more it brings people together. That's what I noticed. Um, and the more it sets people apart, the more, uh, if I could use the word yin, the cooking. So electric would be more yin than gas. So it's the more you get out that way, uh, you know, the more it separates. And so we, we prefer the solar and then the gas here at home. That's my answer. Okay, great. Um, Sherry and Denny, do you have anything to add to that? Because I have one last question I'd like to get to. Um, mm -hmm. Esco gave a good lecture the other day about on his new book, Light Foods, and talked about how it's actually captured some, you know, like uh, cooking on gas is actually a, a form of cooking with wood. So it's still not more energizing and more natural and cooking with electricity is very mechanical oriented and that they're replacing a lot of the gas, you know, stoves like new apartments and buildings and in all the major cities are now not giving you that option as much. Um, so it's really important to use even propane, you know, if you can't get um, gas because um, it's so important for your health and your, your, um, your mental outlook. Alex Jack told this story about how he would go have dinner at this you know, restaurant with Misho and they were cooking on electricity. And each time he would get like really disoriented driving home and getting lost and stuff. So the energy is so much faster and quicker and it, it's not as settling, I think, as gas. Mm. I just wanna- Excuse uh, me, Danny, yeah, before you say anything, um, uh, I'd like you to maybe address this too. So there was a question in the chat that's a, um, the chat that says gas is a fossil fuel though. So if you can maybe when you're giving your answer and your response to other thing, maybe just like briefly address that as well. Um, well, that's, that's, that's a whole other, other question. Um, but at, at, at any rate, one of the things that Carl mentioned, I think is very, very important that cooking on wood or gas, which are both more natural materials, are warm and softer than electricity or microwave. And that allows our energy to combine or align with other people's more easily. And, you know, at French Meadows, I realized that how powerful it was cooking on, uh, on wood, how the people came together like I, I haven't seen for a long, long time. So the point is, you know, it's again, it's an energetic approach. And yes, gas is, is a fossil fuel, but um, how do you generate electricity now? You know, how else do we? So it still might be a better choice until we come up with a, a better energy source, which I think is going to be in the not too distant future that more truly natural, unexhaustible energy sources will start to become known and produced. So that's what I'm thinking. And, and if anybody wants to experiment with it, uh, Cornelia used to do a thing she called blanket cooking where she would start something and she would start it and she would get it hot and it, you know, start, it's boiling, it's going. She would take it off, wrap it in a blanket and let it keep cooking in the blanket rather than keeping it on the stove. So it seemed to work. The, the, everything I tasted at first was delicious. So mm -hmm. it was overly salty, but you know, it was delicious. <laughs> No lack of show you there. <laughs> yeah. I, I've heard of this blanket rice. <laughs> yeah. I've had oatmeal prepared like that where they just like bring it to a boil, like boil it for like a couple minutes, then shut it off and like let it sit all night. Um, and it cooked. You have to have like a heavy pot for that. Right. Okay. So the last question I'm going to propose, if that's all right, Gina, 
thumbs up or okay. Um, there's other basic questions here about soaking grains and beans. Um, but uh, I, I think the more important question is what foods do you recommend to boost immunity? So if you could just name like a few, um, who wants to go first? Okay. So you need prebiotics and probiotics. And um, so you need pickles, fermented foods like miso, things like that, but you also need whole grains so that they can eat off or you know feed the uh, probiotics. Um, so the combination of grains, plant foods with fermented foods is really important. And then a large variety in your diet, like Denny said, you know, you can still get your vitamin C from oranges and things like that for your immunity. Okay. Um, I'd like to, so, you know, the immune system essentially is the system of creating balance and harmony physically and energetically. So it's basically balanced, varied, macrobiotic practice in our, in our diet, activity, and attitudes as well. Because anything that creates stagnation, so you can say too much salt creates stagnation, fear creates stagnation, whatever creates stagnation, or the opposite, surging too high, lowers our immunity. So it's just having a wide variety of healthy foods, different methods of preparation, variety of activity, social interaction, and trying to keep a, a balanced attitude, I think, makes the strongest, because we have mental immunity, physical immunity, many different levels, and macrobiotics has the ability to nourish all. Okay, thank so, you. Carl? Yeah, I would add, uh, the thing I would add is to avoid stress. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. any way you can do that, including if you're stressing, over the fact that you don't have an organic vegetable to cook, that's <laughs> going to cause you, the stress is going to cause you more harm than eating the organic vegetable, just being happy. So, you know, my message is be happy and don't stress over things and, you know, eat. I, I would also say in terms of immunity, uh, I would say eat alkal alkalinizing foods. So more vegetables, and more uh, sea, sea vegetables, as Danny mentioned earlier. That's very important. And, you know, grains, beans, all those things are acid forming. So even though they're macrobiotic, and if you don't put very much salt, which is now a lot of people in macrobiotics use very little salt, which is okay if that's good for your condition, but for some people, they need more salt. And when you take the salt out of the grains, you're making the whole grain more acid for me. So go I ahead, Dave. I went right on to that. In our summer conference, Colin Campbell is going to be talking about this from the scientific point of view, how a whole foods plant-based diet strengthens immunity and invalidates uh, viruses, all viruses. So um, I mean, it's a fascinating subject. So we're looking at it from you know, a practical viewpoint and he's coming from a scientific viewpoint, how um, macrobiotic practice really gives us protection against viruses, which is, you know, when everybody's mind right now and the fear, you know, talking about stress, the fear of just people's fear of what's going on is just, it's so damaging. You gotta realize we have the natural ability to maintain health and happiness throughout life, including immunity. Amen, amen. Okay, thank you. I, I think maybe this is a good like um, finishing spot for today. What do you think, you know? You guys have done great. I so appreciate your time and of course your expertise. It's been a, a great program. And to get all four of you together to give us your time and your knowledge, I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And uh...